I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. A note on tranquility. Uh, like any uh, deliberate cultivation of a state of being, state of mind, of an experience. Sometimes you try and it works. <laughs> Other times you try and it's like trying to light a fire with wet wood. It, it just won't work. And it's okay. Um, you know, sometimes if it won't work, it just was not meant to be. Uh, on the other hand, if it is hard to gradually be able to deliberately cultivate certain qualities of being, that could be a clue that there's some kind of block to it that would be worthwhile exploring and learning about and potentially um, working around or even dissolving over time. Uh, one reason is that certain states of being are really valuable. Uh, in the Buddhist system of uh, seven factors of awakening, tranquility is one of the seven factors, along with uh, mindfulness, investigation, energy, um, bliss, uh, tranquility, concentration, and equanimity. So tranquility. And uh, I like tranquility uh, as a way of experiencing that you're safe enough in the present. You don't need to fight or flee or freeze in the present, whatever the future may hold. And in a state of tranquility, uh, there's a falling away of anxiety, falling away of disturbance, and we start getting in touch with what is unconditionally still, what is inherently still in the mind and ultimately in reality itself. Tranquility. And we live uh, in very untranquil times, as anyone who um, <laughs> is aware <laughs> would know. And so it's really important uh, to find ways to cultivate an inner tranquility. Uh, so, you know, as um, Howard Thurman put it, uh, we can look out in the world with quiet eyes. The world may not be tranquil at all, and yet we can approach it with a place inside that is undisturbed by the various disturbances around us. That does not mean numbing or suppressing or uh, avoiding or, you know, or exercising our privilege of you know, not paying attention. It means finding um, you know, an, an, a place inside that we can return to as a refuge. And even over time is just inherently undisturbed by whatever is happening. So tranquility uh, as a factor of your own awakening and consider, consider you, uh, consider uh, the cultivation of it in your own case. All right. Well, uh, I appreciate some of the, I appreciate all of the many kind things people have been saying in the chat. Thank you very much. Uh, as I've shared with my family and people who are close to me, if I were to give up all of my work activities except one, uh, work broadly, uh, I would keep this, my opportunity each Wednesday to be with you all. And even though I play hooky some Wednesdays, uh, and which creates the opportunity for guest teachers and a diversity of approaches. So anyway, thank you very much for your kindness here uh, to me personally. So I think the audio is working, right? Um, I think we're okay. Yeah, Linda, I think something, maybe worst case, restart your, you know, quit Zoom and come back, maybe restart your computer and come back or check your uh, settings under the, uh, on the microphone at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Okay, I would like to explore with you something that's uh, been extremely uh, relevant to me personally. And that is the difference between approaching life from the standpoint of penetrating into it, making things happen in it, being forceful about it, okay? 
not bad, but it's a way of approaching things that I'm good at, or alternately feeling lived by life, moving through uh, and expressing itself as a kind of uh, continuous outflowing of offerings into, into reality. And that might seem way abstract, uh, but it gets very real if you think about the difference between uh, trying to prove your point to somebody or make something happen inside their mind over there, right? I've clocked a lot of time doing that. Uh, the difference between that and uh, making an offering your view, uh, naming what you think is true, and they're going to do with that whatever they do. It feels really different, doesn't it? It feels really different. Uh, and by the way, I um, appreciate those of you who drop into the chat um, examples that are real for you, let's say, uh, or maybe questions that are real for you as well of what I'm saying. Um, also, we kind of know the feeling if we're um, orienting toward a project, maybe something at work, with a sense of insistence, like it must happen, I must produce this, I must make it so. And notice the ways that that feels different from a kind of flow moving, moving through you, uh, doing the best you can, applying yourself, making efforts, not being lazy, but it's more like it's, it's your offering and reality will, will do what it does with what you offer. Uh, when we are making something happen, we are attached to the result. And we tend to be identified with the result. We take it personally, we, you know, we claim it, we own it. Um, we, get, we don't like it. it. It affects us a lot if, if the result does not occur when we're trying to make something happen. Right. On the other hand, if we're orienting more as offering, we're less attached to the results. We, we may well have understandable preferences. We have values. We hope they see the light. <laughs> you know, we hope they vote for the right person or something. You know, we hope they agree with us that, uh, I don't know, ketchup with French fries is a really good idea most of the time. All right. But we're not attached. We're not so identified with it. We don't take it so personally if it doesn't happen. And sure, there's a little bit of, we could say, a continuum between making and offering. Um, but there's a difference. Now, sometimes we have to make something happen. We just have to. Uh, it's an emergency. Uh, we, we have to produce a result. We have to get down off the mountain. We have to make a teacher deal with our child differently, or we're going to leave the school, or at least that classroom. We have to make something happen. You know, the place for that. It's okay. Um, sometimes you're in physical situations where you just you have to get away. You have to make your escape happen. Okay. On the other hand, what's the wear and tear from that approach to life? making things happen. And how does the difference between making and offering relate to spiritual life, awakening, the upper reaches of human potential, and that inner voice of wisdom inside you that is um, is encouraging you if you're like me, at least, to explore shifting from making to offering. And so I want to drop in a few quotations here and uh, put it in a, a bit of perspective. So here's a quotation from me. Oh my gosh, I'm quoting myself. I don't know, once in a while you find yourself writing something and you think, not too bad. <laughs> so see what you make of it. You know, basically our lives are a, fab a fabric uh, made of many, many, many threads. 
and our opportunity, uh, we are continually weaving new threads. So what sort of weaving? How do we approach the weaving of the fabric of our lives? It could be the same thread, right? We could write the same poem or embark on the same project or have the same conversation or prepare the same meal, same threads, but our, our approach to the weaving can be very different. And that distinction uh, is, is right at the heart of practice. Uh, the Buddha uh, practiced at a time when the great teachers of his era were basically oriented toward an escape from life, leaving life, you know, seen as just uh, kind of a bad place to be. And his approach was really different, the middle way. In other words, how do we be in this life? I'm not trying to escape it. How do we be in this life? What's our approach? What's an approach that creates happiness and welfare or an approach that creates suffering and harm? What's your approach in your life, in, including related to this distinction I'm highlighting here? So uh, a, a little story and then a quotation from the great poet uh, Jane Hirschfield. So long time ago, and this is a story I've written about, you may know it, um, I was talking with my friend David, and uh, this was before Jan and I had children. We were at a party. David and I snuck into the back and were talking, and he was preparing to give his first talk uh, at San Francisco Zen Center, where he was studying to become a priest, let's say, there. And I knew that uh, I had read in the newspaper that various homeless people, unhoused people in the streets of San Francisco were um, coming to the San Francisco Zen Center uh, because there were nice people there <laughs> and it was, it was warm <laughs> and you could get some tea, <laughs> nice place. So I was, I admit it, kind of jealous of David. I was envious of him that he was a big shot and going to give this talk. So I teased him a bit to kind of bring him down, I admit that. And I said, well, David, how do you feel that uh, you're preparing something that's so important to you? And I knew David is and was extremely conscientious and would want to do it well. How do you feel preparing this uh, for people, you know, some of whom they're not listening and they don't care? I thought I was going to take him down a notch. Well, <laughs> He was wiser, and may still be, but he was wiser then than, than I was. And um, he looked at me kind of funny, like I didn't get it because I didn't get it. And he, he made a gesture like this toward me. We were sitting facing each other, like he was placing something at my feet. And he said, essentially, Rick, I just make the offering. And what happens after that is out of my hands, literally out of my hands. Uh, I try to come up with a talk that I care about and maybe put in a joke or two to make it interesting. But really, it's, it's up to them what they do with it. He didn't say it this way, but I would add, it's like my job is to make the offering. Their job is what happens next. And you could see in him was a great peacefulness he was peaceful because he was unattached to the results and he was clear about the distinction between his job and their job and that freed up his attention to do, to do his job really well because he wasn't preoccupied with what would happen over there in the minds of others with his offering. He was simply making the offering and after that, it's out of his hands. Uh, you may know this um, teaching from uh, the great Buddhist teacher Ajahn Chah uh, from Thailand, a great teacher for people like Jack Kornfield and Sharon Salzberg and others. And um, Ajahn Chah said, essentially, uh, you can water a fruit tree, but you cannot make it give you an apple. I'm paraphrasing a big chunk of stuff. And so we make the offering. We choose a good tree, we plant it well, we take good care of it, we water it, but we realize we cannot make an apple. 
And that orientation that focuses on tending to the causes while realizing that we cannot control the results um, can bring us both to peace and to responsibility. We become more peaceful about the results while foregrounding and clearing the decks for, clearing a space for our actual responsibility. So to uh, quote uh, Jane Hirschfield, here we go. Think of the difference between making, right? The fist that can only act on the world in a single way by banging or offering with the hand, right? That can do infinite things. So I invite you to consider in your own life the difference between the two, and I invite you to consider maybe the degree to which, like me, you've been trained by our culture to orient toward achievement and accomplishment and even a lot in relating to others in the form of making. You know, when I um, you know, grew up, uh, for complex reasons, I was fairly, I was quite unhappy and pretty dysfunctional <laughs> interpersonally as a kid. And uh, I did not know how to do it, but I knew by the time I was 15 for sure that I wanted something different for myself and that it was kind of up to me to, to make that happen, to make it happen, right? Make it happen. And so then as I went off to college, I, I started really drawing on you know my capacities for determination and willfulness and analysis and planning and then pursuing goals to make things happen, to make results occur. And then the world started noticing <laughs> that about me and began <laughs> rewarding me for doing that and recruiting me to do that and paying me money to do that. And there we were and that felt good and on and on and on. So you might think about your own history of the ways in which, not your fault, um, conventional schooling is about making results, making A's, making uh, term papers, right? Um, making good grades. Then we go through life and we make results at work. We make projects happen. We make others happy. We make meals for them. You know, the making. And there's a place for that. But ask yourself, huh, are there aspects of that for you that have been too, you know, that, that have been pressured and stressful for you? And is there another way? Is there another way? And so here I'd like to share with you two sentences that I came upon on retreat uh, at Spirit Rock Meditation Center, a uh, good place to go on retreat, uh, back in the fall. And you have to kind of slow down the words to really let this land here. So this is a quotation from the great uh, Zen master Dogen, who I believe lived and taught in Japan in roughly the 1200s. Uh, and his first sentence here describes my way of life a lot, sometimes still in the present. Conveying oneself toward all things to carry out practice is delusion. Second sentence, all things coming and carrying out practice through the self is realization. And in the first approach, there is an I over here, a self separated from life, separated from reality, who then acts upon reality in goal-directed ways. That's a conventional approach to life. And Dogen's argument, his view, uh, is that that approach to life, while being commonplace and understandable, uh, is certainly no way to become enlightened. And it actually perpetuates the separation and the self-referentiality, the selfing, the me, myself, and I-ness that obstructs ultimate liberation in our relationship to all things. 
And so his radical, and radical, not fooling around, Zen, whack, right? Radical approach is the second sentence in which we uh, increasingly relax and tranquilize goal-directed, deliberate, forceful making. We tranquilize it and more and more things are living through us out into the world. Now, how to operate a restaurant or do therapy with people or write a book or raise children or do the dishes in, on the basis of the second sentence, that is very much a work in progress and extremely um, wise people, including you all, I'm sure, have been grappling with that question. How can we uh, be that open space in which process occurs, manifesting the necessary and good and important things in our lives? That's, that's a real question here. And my suggestion is that what characterizes the first sentence from Dogen is the sense of making, of force of uh, insistence, you know, there's a uh, about it. And what characterizes the second sentence is a quality of offering. Now, what is it that you're offering? It's easy to answer the question, what are you making? What are we offering? First and foremost, We are offering our qualities of being. Sincerity. We are offering our own sincerity. We're not here to play games or to trick people or manipulate them or con them. We're authentic. We're not saying everything we think, but what we do say is real for us. We're being real. Sincerity, right? We're offering that. Uh, We are offering our good heart. We're here to help, not hurt. We we are here to build up rather than tear down, right? We are looking for the good, the good in others, the good that we can join with. We are looking for the good we can create. We are looking for the good we can nurture and protect, right? This is you I'm talking about. I'm talking about you. (laughs) <laughs> what are you offering? You are offering your sincerity. You are offering your good, your good heart. You are offering your attention. We are offering um, our presence. We're here, right? We're here. Right? We also offer various talents and the training of those talents into skills. Uh, we're offering our energy our love, our warmth, our compassion, our kindness, right? We tend to fixate on uh, qualities of doing, and we tend to think that, you know, we're offering what we have. Most fundamentally, we are offering what we be, offering, you know, our qualities of being. So So the cultivation of being and qualities of being is absolutely central and so profoundly valuable. So you might ask yourself, wow, what am I already offering? In other words, already offering before you make anything, before you do anything in your being, what is being offered in the present, at work, in relationships, in how you move through the world, how you interact with non-human animals, what are you already offering in how you be that, that's worth noticing, right? And second, what, if anything, are you cultivating in your offering into the world? Uh, I started focusing some years ago on cultivating a kind of lovingness and um, lovingness, you know, uh, as something that was important to cultivate, right? Uh, I'm working on patience. 
That's <laughs> another quality of being to cultivate. Uh, you know, um, what are you cultivating as qualities of being in your offering? You know, simply listening, presence is an amazing offering. Sometimes other people don't know what to do with it because you're actually listening. And yet that receptivity is an offering. So quick little summary so far, uh, highlighting an orientation to life that's about offering. Uh, second, uh, highlighting that we offer certainly our qualities of being. And third, I'm highlighting the deliberate cultivation of certain qualities of being, such as these various factors of awakening, like mindfulness, presence, tranquility, loving kindness. Okay? And then I want to bring in um, another aspect here, which is to quote Joseph Goldstein, when we take ourselves out of the picture, then all that's left is everything. I'll put that in the quotation, in the sidebar here in the chat. So it's interesting that in making, there tends to be a pretty strong sense of self. In offering, sense of self tends to fall away because an offering is moving through us, out into the world. And as Joseph puts it, when we take that sense of self out of the way, there's more space for everything to move through us, to benefit other people and certainly ourselves in some ways. I had a, a, a really powerful experience I've also written about, um, so forgive me in advance here if this is repetitious. Uh, some years ago, uh, when my career as an author was just starting to take off, uh, Tara Brock, when a, a friend and teacher and benefactor, uh, opened a door that enabled me to be a speaker at a major conference uh, many years ago, maybe 15 or more years ago. And I was, I was the smallest frog in that big pond uh, on the main stage. And I was sitting in the audience while these various famous people in kind of the world of psychotherapy and mindfulness, the combination of the two, uh, were up there on the stage and saying wonderful things. I was sitting in the audience really nervous about um, my talk. It was the first time I was gonna give a big talk about how to use the brain to change your life for the better. And uh, I was preoccupied and trying on different lines and imagining different ways of saying things so that I would look really good and I'd make them realize how smart I was. I'd make them know that I was right. You know? <laughs> I'd make them think I was superior. Ugh. And I was just getting more and more freaked out and unhappy and losing it. So I'm sitting in the back of the room and I'm going to be on stage in 15 minutes or less, tick tock, counting down. So I went, ugh. So I looked around for something to distract myself with and stumbled on, I just saw this little newsletter, like a local newsletter, which fortuitously, gosh, magically, I don't know, had an interview with the Dalai Lama. Wow. So I started reading it a little bit and I just came you know, got into his transmission, his state of mind, his state of being. He was offering his way of being, which was oriented around compassion and service to others. Getting out of your own way, right? Uh, as Joseph Goldstein talked about it. And I had a basically a deep kind of realization that if I stopped being so preoccupied with myself, I would be much more able to be truly of service to others, which, and I started laughing, was one of the best ways to be good to myself. 
if you follow that. So I, you know, did give the talk, and I was, you know, Rick was back here. What was foregrounded were the people in the room, and wanting to be of service to them, having a sense of them as beings, and being in relationship with them. And it was really about the offering of value to them. I was out of it. I was back there. They were here, and so that's the way I did the talk. And uh, as an, you know, a relevant detail uh, to my story at the end, I got a standing ovation, the only standing ovation at that conference. And uh, it was an incredibly deep teaching about whew, getting out of ourselves and our self-preoccupation and really, really being over there with others, which is really, really good for them and, and uh, not too bad for yourself as well. So offering very often has that quality. Uh, a kind of selflessness in it. We're not, I'm not per talking about what's called pathological altruism. I'm talking about a kind of, you know, being lived by, being danced by the music, being danced by the dance as it flows through you with less and less self-consciousness in the process. So a couple more things and then I'll see what questions there might be, okay? So, um, da -da 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 -da. now I want to talk about maybe the ultimate wellspring of what we're offering, what is moving through us here. And here I want to quote Anne Klein. A scholar and teacher of Tibetan Buddhism, who's talking here about Dzogchen which is uh, sometimes translated as the great perfection. And uh, Dr. Klein uh, refers to it as the great completeness, that things are already complete as they are. Uh, and, she, and I love the, the way she's describing it here as backlit. Like here we are in reality, here we are in what we're doing, and maybe that which is flowing through us you know, reality altogether is flowing through us to, 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 to construct the offering in the present moment, moving through, right? And it's kind of neat to imagine, you know, that all of that is, um, which seems like parts, right? Parts interacting with parts. All of that is backlit by, or in the context of a great completeness. And that's a really... That's a wild way to approach how you are in the world, right? Like to feel already complete and this moment is already complete and this offering is already complete as the offering continues to be made. I don't want to get abstract about that, you know, but I think there's something like in poetry and I'll be sharing some poetry with you in a moment. In poetry, there's some, there's a truth in it that, escapes the nets of language. And yet, we know it's true. Right. So I also want to quote here from Harada Roshi. Whoops. Great. He, he writes, He's referring to an awakening he had. And in awakening, we recognize what's true. So even if the awakening experience fades and is impermanent, experiences are impermanent, but sometimes what we experience is permanently true. Unconditioned, for example, the absolute is permanently the case, right? So he writes, I knew true peace that all is well. There is no inside, no outside, all is one, one all-encompassing one. This truth is universal. Wherever you find yourself, there is only this one truth. One reality, one everything, perhaps one combination of conditioned and unconditioned, all together moving through you. 
And people report, and you know, it's my own journey as well, so you start to have a sense of the absolute working through you or operating in your place. Maybe that's a way to put it. Uh, not in a way that is grandiose, like, oh, I'm so special. If you think you're so special <laughs> that the absolute is working through you, you're not in touch with the absolute, <laughs> right? And still, as a fact, it can be a way of orienting to life and your life a kind of an opening to what what is, in a sense, wanting to live through you, wanting to move through you. So I offer that here. And finishing. Aha. Good. So now as we make the offering, we also recognize what is so not good in the world. This making the offering is not a kind of spiritual bypass or looking at the world through rose-colored glasses. And here I'd like to drop in a short poem from Adrian Rich. She writes, my heart is moved by all I cannot save. So much has been destroyed. I have to cast my lot with those who, age after age, perversely, with no extraordinary power, reconstitute the world. So cool, right? Wow. <laughs> right. I think of, what's the, please help me here with the Hebrew. So, alam tekun tekun to repair, to mend the world, to mend the world. I wrote earlier that, re, you know, the, our lives are a fabric. Reality is a big fabric. Uh, we, we cannot help, it's made of many threads. We cannot help weaving. How shall we weave the fabric of our lives? In what way? On what basis shall we weave the fabric of our lives? On what basis shall we repair the world? We can repair a lot of things by making repair, the problem is that the act of making often involves some kind of tearing, if only the wear and tear of stress upon ourselves. Um, can we repair the world in with the feeling and the sensibility of making an offering into the world? All right. So I'll, I'll repeat what Adrian Rich wrote. Uh, <clears throat> My heart is moved by all I cannot save. So much has been destroyed. I have to cast my lot with those who, age after age, perversely, with no extraordinary power, reconstitute the world. Adrian Ranch. And then two have Gary Snyder, who I'm particularly fond of, in part because of his love of nature and wonderful way of writing about it. Uh, I hope this poem fits into the chat. Yes. Lately, I've been quite um, preoccupied, like many, with the climate crisis, as was Gary Snyder. And you can see some of the metaphors that he's using for the children. The rising hills, the slopes of statistics lie before us. The steep climb of everything going up, up as we all go down. In the next century, or the one beyond that, they say, our valleys, pastures, we can meet there in peace if we make it. To climb these coming crests, one word to you, to you and your children. Stay together. Learn the flowers. Go light. It's a way of being, right? Our offering primarily is our being, 
and ways of being and qualities of being. Staying, being together, staying together, learning, learning the flowers and going light. So, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> Probably a good idea. <laughs> Maybe I'll, I'll finish on this. Um, so I've, we have focused here on how we are, right? And of course, we affect others. Um, and when we act in ways, maybe unnecessarily, that threaten others or promote their contracted, pressured, separated making of things, uh, we, you know, we're influencing them. And, uh, Maybe a takeaway here uh, is to consider how we interact with others that pushes them or triggers them or needlessly, perhaps, into a kind of making versus offering orientation. Offering the open hand is undefended. Making already is somewhat defended if only by its momentum. Offering is gentler, it's more spacious, slower, typically. And uh, think about our effect on others, whether we are offering an invitation to make their own offerings and offering a space into which they can make their offerings. Are we doing that? Or, are we pushing on them with what we are making so that we're, we are increasing the likelihood of them responding in a making way themselves? Right? If we are making them wrong, understandably, do they respond by making themselves right? That's a reflection. Alas, I'm not going to be able to take a question, so I, I won't be able to do that tonight and talk with you for real. I'm, I'm sorry about that, just looking at the time here and the overall flow. Um, okay. This is very interesting. So Margot asks a really important question at 27 minutes past the hour. Um, I'll say it. Could one apply what you are talking about tonight to interactions with people who are difficult? For example, someone who uses sarcasm as a weapon in communication. Could you just offer yourself in goodness and then step away from the negative response? I, I would say yes to the extent I know your situation. And I, you're getting at a really important point that this orientation to offering is, yes, it's less defended. So to be able to sustain it, we need to resource ourselves with a kind of strength and clarity on our own behalf. Um, I think of the Buddhist teaching that uh, one is wise, one is truly wise, who is peaceable, friendly, and fearless. And so it's that fearlessness and resourcing ourselves to be fearless or to take into account threats and respond to them in ways that help us stay safe. Um, we're able to, to make that offering, but not let ourselves be mistreated. And sometimes the way that looks is that we offer our being, we offer our dignity, we offer our listening, we offer our presence, and then we may disengage. And in many ways, our offering is our example to others. Right? Simply being someone 
who is clearly not intimidated by someone who's being or wanting to be intimidating, who does not uh, presume that you are you know, less than or weaker than or less important than another person who's trying to make you feel that way and trying to um, have others uh, um, agree that you are that way. If you instead refuse to accept that script, you will not be cast into that role. That example is a great offering to others that makes can make a really big difference for them. Well, okay. This has been my offering. <laughs> and I am coming to the end of it. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> I invite you to just explore and be aware of the distinction between, you know, making and offering. Sometimes we just have to make, okay. But is there maybe a possibility to come into things more on the basis of an offering orientation than a making orientation, including in things like sending emails and, and uh, explaining yourself and persuading others or uh, et cetera. Um, can you do that? And um, ask yourself as well, what are you offering as qualities of being in particular? And what is moving through you as an offering that you can open to and take refuge in and trust in and and find your secure base in and be, you know, lived by, including in increasingly profound ways. That's that's good. Really good. Okay. <laughs>